Welcome to the Rose Show podcast. Thank you, Rosanna, for, for setting this up. Absolutely. Thank you so much for joining, Jay. So much to learn from you. We're very excited to be speaking this evening. It's our first time speaking together. So I'm truly honored for this moment. Same here. I, um, you know, we just got off a, I didn't realize we were going to have this three to four hour Tesla spaces. And, you know, I, I frankly, I'm not an expert um, in Tesla and it, it, it went in a number of different directions. So just getting some water and, uh, you know, finding my seat in front of the computer and, and we'll be with you in a few minutes. Sounds great. Well, I loved your questions and we'll be discussing them during this space as well. You asked some great questions. I think Elon was uh, taken aback by one of the questions regarding the stock buyback. That was a great question. Yeah, thanks. It just it, it makes sense in this environment, you know, given where the cost of capital is today to invest in, your, you know, if you believe your business has above a 20 percent return, it makes more sense to invest in your business, you know, than you know, than to buy equity because, um, you know, when interest rates are at zero, it's almost a no brainer to buy equity, borrow, you know, borrow at one percent if you're Apple and buy back stock. You know that environment is completely different today, and I think it's it's something that's going to affect um, companies across the S and P five hundred. You know, you saw Charter shelve its buyback plan and invest more in capex, and the stock was derated. You know, investors, institutional investors specifically, they penalize companies for for not because they tend to be short term myop myopically focused. They penalize companies for not investing in you know buying back shares and raising dividends um and they they essentially sell stock when a company is reinvesting in itself like intel right when intel announced you know a 70 billion dollar capex plan you know not one stock analyst not one buy side manager said hey we're gonna buy intel they all said oh my god this is terrible it's free cash flow is gonna go negative for the next three to four years and the stock has been underperforming ever since even though it's trading at like a four to five times multiple. And one would argue that even after the $3 billion cost cutting plan that Intel announced, you know, it still hasn't inflected because the market is just assuming that these guys are going to be, instead of using cash to benefit shareholders in the short term, they're going to be using cash to reinvest in their infrastructure. Um, and people are interested in quick money. They don't want to wait three years or five years to make money. They want to make money next quarter. And that's kind of, unfortunately, just how our capital market system works. It tends to be myopically focused on the quarter. So we get a lot of interesting anecdotes out of Elon, you know, and I tried to direct the conversation more towards the capital markets and less towards, you know, random questions about features and things that we can all read about online. And I thought it was really a really fun call and people are able to learn a lot from it. Um, and there's some things that I think, you know, he shared that, you know, might've been obvious to him, but, but they were not obvious to some of the listeners. So, you know, the focus of today is going to be more so, um, you know, what's going on, you know, recap of what, what's happened, you know, this year and last year, what we think is, is brewing um, for the next year, you know, we're going to be discussing policymaking from the ECB's perspective, the Bank of England's perspective, the Bank of Japan's perspective, the People's Bank of China, and obviously the Federal Reserve, you know, the largest central banks, you know, what they've done. We've had, you know, coordinated tightening for the first time in, in history and, and, you know, how that could potentially impact securities, what you should be looking at when it comes to, you know, next quarter earnings. You know, on the prior call, there was discussion about recession, there's a discussion about economic slowdown. What does that necessarily mean? In what scenarios could a recession actually be positive for securities? Um, in what scenarios recession could be negative? Um, so those are kind of, you know, some of the topics, very high level, broad topics that we wanted to touch on um, in this space. And then, you know, we do, um, you know, we do a Sunday 630 space as well. That tends to be, you um, macro focus as well. And then we do an ideas focus space at 2.30 Eastern on Sundays that focuses on our own ideas, long and short across bonds, fixed income, closed end funds, preferred stocks, um, and SPACs that we've been short. So, 
you know, thank you for, um, for, for setting this up, you know, wanted to, awesome. to yeah. see, you know, first, you know, if you had any questions, I know that there are a number of topics that you wanted to touch on. If there's some, something that you wanted to start with or any questions that. that you yeah. Have. What I'd like to do. Thank you so much for that rundown. Um, you're like an encyclopedia, like a wealth of knowledge. I love it. Um, yeah. I actually have an outline for us. I have an introduction for the show. And then I have, um, as we discussed, I had sent you in the direct message, we can go through some points through the Fed, inflation, labor market, you know, all those important elements, you know, the GDP, and then go into the yen. Love to ha have your ideas on what's going on in Europe and the yen and Japan. And then um, we can go into the discussion that you had with Elon and some of the questions that were very interesting. And I'd like to know your take. I actually like to know your opinion on um, on some of those. And then I want to go into the different asset classes. And I like to break those down because this is a different landscape that we've been in for quite a long time. And we need to go over the diversification of different asset classes because to many people, diversification just means, oh, I'm going to get uh, a tech stock and I'm going to get uh, maybe a value stock and this and that. But actually, diver diversification means, you know, fixed income, securities, credit, commodities, you know, treasuries, and I like to go into all those bonds, especially. I love your expertise in bonds. Um, so we could go over that and what our outlook is for 2023. Um, and then I'd love to go over your business and you can discuss all the different plans that you offer. Um, I think all of us are very interested in knowing more about that. And we can end on that note. Um, how does that sound? Yeah, that sounds good. So okay. if you wanted to follow the outline, you know, please, you know, if you wanted to, as a moderator, you know, go through mm -hmm. the topics, I'm happy to, um, you know, to keep right. it more, more organized because I tend to just have a stream. Of you know what, if you may tell you, Jay, if you go off on your stream, we all are all going to be loving it and enjoying it. So please feel free. This is your space. You, you go off on any tangent you want, because I love, we love learning from you. And that's why we're all here is to learn from you. So thank you. So welcome to Macro Market, Elon and Tesla Talk with Macro J Special Situation. I give you that name now, Macro J. Thank you for joining us this evening. We hope to make this space educational and lots of fun. Quick disclaimer, please do not construe this as investment or financial advice. I'm Rosanna, your host, and I'm here with Jay of Special, special Situation Research Newsletter. In this space, we will discuss macroeconomics, markets, various asset classes, outlook for 2023, and Elon and Tesla. As Jay, you just spoke with Elon about not even two hours ago. So very exciting discussions ahead. So Jay, you did uh, tell us a little bit about yourself. If you want to tell us more, please do. Um, if not, we can begin with the Fed and inflation. And I would love to know your thoughts on this recent deceleration pattern with the CPI. And if you believe it will continue, do you believe we are in a deceleration and that inflation is coming down and will continue? Or do you believe that this current deflationary forces in the core goods has bottomed and will reverse at some time next year. So inflation may re-accelerate. Are you in that camp? Because I've been reading a lot of that research as well. What are your thoughts on all that? Sure. So those are a handful of questions. I'll start out, you know, my background is a special situations investor. And I tend to be very blunt. You know, I'm not even a macro guy. I tend to focus on the macro when the markets inflect. So when you go from growth to deceleration or from deceleration back to growth. And the game in town for the last 20 years has been the Fed. You know, when I started out, you know, the Fed was a lot less important. You know, I was doing merger arbitrage, you know, buying potential target companies, shorting their acquirers, you know, looking at break price, trying to make 20% spreads, um, you know, doing convert ARB, you know, buying bonds, shorting the stock, making, making an ARB, buying distressed securities, buying companies through bankruptcy, through turnarounds um, like Hertz that we saw, you know, is even personally a big, uh, had a big stake in the unsecureds, converted those into the equities and, and sold 
um, for over 200% during COVID. Um, you know, understanding complex capital structures and org structures, an example of that would be like a colony capital, which is now digital bridge, you know, at the worst of COVID, this was trading at like a dollar 90 a share, it's, it's split, so you can't reverse split, so you can't see it. Um, the bonds were trading at big discounts, the preferreds were trading at 60-70% discounts and were playing, paying 20% current yields, was able to understand that all of the debt at the hotel and nursing home subsidiaries was non-recourse to the parent, so they could essentially file bankruptcy in all of those operating subsidiaries and keep the data center assets, um, and that trade was a home run. So I tend to focus on complex situations um, in the capital markets, whether it's in bonds, whether it's in um, preferreds or equity, um, or in closed end funds, funds that you can buy at discounts to NAV, whether there's an activist involved or not. Saba um, and Bulldog tend to be the big activists in this space. And it, I have relationships and friends across the you know the industry where we, we are able to harvest and talk about ideas. And we have a, an interesting you know discord with you know a few hundred people, you know, some are professionals, some are semi-professionals. Um, the average age actually skews to above 40 years old. So you tend to have very, you know, mature conversations about secure, you know, about just brainstorming securities, valuation, understanding industries, competitive landscapes. And it's an interesting, um, you know, area where I'm able to learn from other people as well. And, um, you know, there's a channel there where other people propose ideas and we, we debate them. So, you know, Twitter's done a lot uh, for me in terms of broadening my horizons. I, I used to only follow a couple macro accounts for information, um, you know, on energy and a couple of topics where, you know, I found that Twitter is a little bit faster um, than Bloomberg or Reuters Bridge Station or any of the other media outlets out there. So, you know, it's an excellent free tool for people to use. You guys are so lucky that you have spaces today. When I was starting out, we had the Yahoo Finance message boards, and it was just just people smack talking each other and, and, and spewing garbage. So, you know, we have some of that on here as well. But uh, this is a much more civilized um, platform than it was, um, you know, even two years ago. So, you know, what has happened over the last couple years? You know, like we said, you know, with Bernanke, um, after the great financial crisis, you had QE1, QE2, QE3, Operation Twist. And that was the start of, in fact, Bernanke is the one who taught the Bank of Japan what, Q, you know, how to implement QE. There's actually a white paper that he wrote over 20 years ago that you can actually pull up and read. Um, but, you know, we've had financial repression. And at the peak, we had $18 trillion of bonds in the world that were, that had a negative interest rate. And, you know, even prior to COVID, you know, in Europe and Japan, you know, it was very hard to earn any yield. And we're in an environment, you know, one, due to very high leverage, two, uh, due to the financialization of, of the markets and the Fed's uh, reliance on this put. Um, we've, we've been in a situation where, you know, because of low interest rates, it's, it's been easy for federal governments, corporations and individuals to borrow more and more and more and more. And debt levels have continued to rise. And it's one of the reasons why the market is so ill positioned for interest rates at 5% plus because of the amount of, you know, federal and corporate and individual debt. And it's frankly the reason why the Fed has had to move so quickly um, because the Fed has, you know, two to three years before, you know, bonds roll over and it actually has to pay and the Treasury has to pay higher interest rates, which translate into higher taxes for the individual. It's something that people don't really talk about. But one of the reasons why, you know, we've gone from super easing um, because of this terrible shock. And, you know, we had half a million people die in the U.S. Uh, from COVID. We had 2.9 million people you know, have to retire because they couldn't find child, child care and other reasons. We've had, you know, millions of people in, around the world die. The biggest, uh, you know, pandemic since the Spanish flu in the early 1900s, you know, <clears throat> this quantitative easing and, you know, the $8 trillion of stimulus that the Fed did, you know, put us in a pretty precarious situation. Um, and it forced people to borrow more and to speculate more. And we, we were at a point um, in November of 2021, it was actually, frankly, we started talking about it in spring of 2021, where the Fed realized that if they didn't move, um, <clears throat> things would get a lot worse. So there are three types of inflation that were created, you know, from the Fed's actions and I'm I'm skipping over a lot of different topics for the sake of time, um, but you have goods inflation, 
right? You have real estate, which is represented by OER, um, and you have services inflation, okay? On the good side, you know, a lot of the goods inflation that we've seen, um, you know, which has been in headlines, you know, after the Ukraine um, war, you know, you had a spike of WTI crude oil to 130. You had supply chain issues that were due to COVID that were made worse after the Ukraine crisis. And you had, you know, goods inflation, high single digits. In reality, you know, CPI is a basket of goods. It doesn't capture a lot of categories. You were looking at basic expenses like grocery bills. You know, in certain parts of the United States, groceries are 25% more expensive than they were 18 months ago. And this has put pressure on, you know, lower wage workers, you know, because the average wage is only at 5%. So, you know, while we've seen the biggest, biggest wage growth in the last 30, 40 years, um, it still hasn't caught up to inflation. So the idea is now, you know, that supply chains are easing. You look at the ports of California, um, you look at lower um, economic demand and slowing economy, you know, goods, goods inflation will likely be handled. Um, and there's certain categories that are going to be more stubborn than others, like agriculture. But overall, um, we think that there's certain categories of, of goods inflation that have already gone negative, like used car prices. We think that other categories will go negative through next year. But we think OER, which it operates at like over a 12 month lag, owner's equivalent rent, um, is a very delayed measure that the Fed uses to essentially estimate uh, real estate inflation. And that's because, you know, you just think about it, common sense, you know, your lease doesn't, everyone's lease doesn't expire at the same time. So the Fed essentially pulls, you know, <clears throat> multifamily operators about how, you know, how much they think they can raise rents by, and it's a flawed measure. So, you know, when rents were rising 20%, you know, OER was 5%. And now we're, you know, now OER is above 7%. You know, rents in parts of the U.S. are actually falling. Real estate prices are down 11% in the Bay Area. And, you know, places, you know, outside of the U.S. where, you, where you've seen uh, a bigger bubble, you know, there are places in Toronto where real estate prices are down 30, 40 percent. Um, and, you know, there are parts in the U.S. where prices, real estate prices are going to come down a lot faster due to rates. And this is what's happened when you think about basic cap, the capital asset pricing model. And you think about how a stock is valued. Right. People look at stocks and they think it's like a game. It's really not right. Capital should flow to its best and highest economic use. And. You know, when whether it's in the form of of bonds, mezzanine, preferred or equity, you know, there are different securities. You know, each security has a QCIP. These QCIPs, right, they're assigned and the securities that are associated have different risks and reward profiles based on where they fall in the capital structure. You know what the company what the company is doing in terms of its P&L, you know, how competitive the industry is. And you can't just look at them like a piece of paper. When you buy a stock, you you own a percentage uh, of a business. When you buy a bond, you're a creditor or a lender to a business. And when you buy a preferred or a mezzanine security some or a convertible bond, you have both. You not only, um, if you have a convert, you not only are you a lender, but you also have a call option in the company. And when it comes to preferred, um, you know, you are a senior equity holder that in bankruptcy gets paid you know, above the common equity. And if you buy that security discount, you can make a capital gain on it, but you are not a residual owner. So those are just some basic concepts I wanted to touch on before going into the details. So as not to confuse people. Um, and when you when it comes to, you know, the different central banks around the world, we are at a point now where every single central bank outside of the Bank of Japan which, by the way, was forced to widen its band before Kuroda leaves in March, which we'll get to in a second, which resulted in a reverse in the end from 150 to 130 period of a month. But every single cent large central bank in the world is tightening, right? If you look at the NAFTA countries, Canada and Mexico started even before the U.S., right? Because you know the, they are levered to the U.S. economy. And you, you notice every time the U.S. hikes, you know, Banksico and the Bank of Canada, you know, hike an equivalent amount. Now, Canada has, has has to slow down because of the number of floating rate mortgages, but banks go will likely continue. And, you know, ECB, actually, if you listen to Lagarde's speech last week, which is why the market sold off, sold off um, last week, the ECB is also in, in a mode of raising rates at over 50 basis points in its next meeting. So it's going to be hiking faster than the U.S. Interest rate differentials drive are one of the factors that drive currency strength. So in addition to what we've been seeing in 
you know, in terms of financial tightening, where the U.S. has raised its overnight rate, you know, from zero to four and a half percent, where, you know, Europe, you've gone from zero to two and a half percent. You have increased the cost of capital for companies, for counties, for states, for individuals, um, for private and public entities to borrow money. And that tightens up financial conditions. It also, you know, puts a burden on the consumer, right? Um, where the cost of borrowing for the consumer is more expensive and it should affect at some point their ability to, to buy, especially big ticket items like cars and autos. But when you take a step back, countries have deficits and surpluses as well. Um, and when you think about countries, you know, the U.S. is a reserve currency. A lot of emerging market countries have U.S. dollar denominated debt. And when, you know, U.S. interest rates were rising very sharply over the past six months, the U.S. dollar strengthened about 22 percent. The trade weighted dollar, the strongest rallying the dollar in several years versus EM currencies, it roiled emerging markets because not only did their currencies depreciate, the debt service on the U.S. debt they had outstanding was a lot higher because they had to pay more dollars back as their currency was cheaper. Not not only that, as their currencies depreciated, inflation, inflation was higher in their local currency because commodity prices are denominated in dollars. And we'll get more into that into a second. So the U.S. dollar also resulted in, in a big risk off along with financial tightening in the U.S. And, you know, while these moves were inevitable, um, the speed of the moves is what shocked the market. And you saw big drawdowns across all global bond and equity markets. The reason why the Fed has had to move so quickly is if you look at, you know, the well over eight trillion of securities on the Federal Reserve balance sheet, three trillion of which are mortgage backed securities backed by Fannie Mae, Freddie Mac and Ginnie Mae. Um, one is an explicit guarantee. The other two are implicit guarantees. These securities um, pay interest. Right. So you can kind of think I almost thought like, OK, the Fed was, it was kind of like a, a pseudo Ponzi where you have 30 trillion of, of federal debt and about a third of that is owned by the Treasury. So we're essentially paying ourselves. Now, when you essentially allow securities, what quantitative tightening is, quantitative easing is when the Fed, the central bank is buying uh, bonds as increasing reserves. Quantitative tightening is the opposite when you're either selling securities, which the Fed is not doing off its balance sheet, or allowing them to mature so that the balance sheet shrinks. What that does is it reduces the reserves in the system. Now we had excess liquidity in the system, so you're not seeing you know, a lot of volatility in money markets or you know, any severe type of short-term funding volatility, but what you are seeing um, is a higher cost of capital for the average company. For the you know the thousands of companies in the high yield and leveraged loan markets today, the high yield market is about a one one point three trillion dollar market. You know, leveraged loan market is about one and a half trillion dollar market, and the private credit markets that you all read about on CNBC, Reuters, um, where the Blackstones of the world, Aries, and a lot of these funds have raised a lot of capital, three hundred billion a year, is about a trillion two. So when you add the, all those things together, you know, you have about almost you have almost you know, four and a half, five trillion dollars worth of leverage lending to companies that have ratings for Moody's and S&P below triple B minus or BAA three. Those leverage lending markets are the companies that borrow on the margin where increases in interest rates can materially affect their ability to fund themselves and where default risk, their probability of default, which is a forward indicator on unemployment, has gone up materially. And that is reflected in the spreads of the debt of those companies um, and is what determines, you know, what you see the talking heads talking about, oh, high yield is up X amount, high yield is down this amount. You know, what's really happening is there are two components of a bond. You have the risk-free rate, which in the U.S. would be a treasury rate um, or, you know, for 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 leverage loans or bonds, a SOFR or a LIBOR, sometimes a one month or a three month um, versus an actual spread, which essentially is a, is a risk spread that, <clears throat> estimates the probability of default net of the recovery for these bonds over a certain duration. So <clears throat> what's happened, you know, while, you know, the Fed has been tightening is not only has it had the dollar strengthened, and we'll talk about why that was reversed, and that roiled emerging markets and made it difficult for us, um, you know, hurt our net, hurt our net exports. Um, two, 
we had a situation where the cost of capital increase for individuals, corporations, and states, which obviously is going to hurt incremental demand. Three, we have a situation where the cost of capital for high yield companies um, that you know are only cover their 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 interest by it's called the fixed charge coverage ratio by three to four times. So are seeing their their floating rate rate interest costs more than double because if the average company was borrowing at a spread of three fifty and and three month LIBOR is four point seven five percent, you've more than doubled your cost of borrowing, right? And that's that's increasing the probability of default. And you had companies that because their cost of labor increasing and their cost of interest is increasing, are finding ways to cut costs. And they're doing that by cutting the easiest things, advertising and headcount. So it becomes a self-fulfilling cycle where all these things happening at the same time are, are working together to slow down the economy. And why hasn't the economy slowed down as quickly? And why is the Fed in a tough situation where it, it has to increase rates so quickly? Well, one, we had four trillion of savings not only individual savings, but we had several you know, trillion dollars of cash that companies raised during COVID. They pushed their maturities out to 2025, 2027, so that companies were flush with cash, like the average cash, even for indebted companies, the average cash to debt ratio went from like 12% in the in the last debt crisis, like the Chinese recession of 2015, 16, when oil went to 30, to 19 percent so the cash to debt ratios even for these indebted companies were very high and you had people that made seven and a half trillion dollars through the appreciation mark to market of the real estate holdings 66 percent of americans have some ownership in a home or their family owns a home and 31 percent of 401ks and those 401ks believe it or not are still only 16 percent from all-time highs so we had a situation where there's a lot of wealth created and a lot of cash on the sidelines and that has prevented the recession from catching on as quickly as it has in the has it as it has in the past in prior cycles, right? And the the wealth creation has been at you know at the top tiers, right? At the wealthy and at the above median income, you know, demographics. But you know, the lower end of you know, consumer has been hurt the most. But when you look at you know credit card data travel data, um, you look at even sales of companies that should be under pressure, like Wayfair, um, you you know, because of inflation, it's it's a tricky picture because in prior recessions, you're entering a deflation area scenario because inflation is so high. Companies are have still been able to beat their revenue estimates and beat their earnings estimates because of pricing, right? You guys saw UPS, right? UPS announced cost cutting. And then, you know, they've raised their prices, but their units are are underwhelming. And the reason why, you know, the stock isn't lower is because their stocks benefit from inflation, right? It's it's simple. So in real terms, your real earnings and real revenues might be lower or your unit sales might be lower, but because stocks express their earning, their gap earnings in in nominal terms, we're in it's this is the toughest, toughest recession to predict. Um, and if you were on the call with Elon, I mean, Elon's having trouble figuring out his price to, you know, price to unit sales equation because it's a really difficult situation. It, you know, you could look at one side of things and say, well, people are earning their nominal incomes are the highest ever. And companies like PepsiCo have been able to raise their prices 22 percent and, you know, are seeing the highest earnings you could have ever imagined. Right. On the other hand, you're looking at you know, a, a sharply declining demand for autos and big ticket items where, you know, the cost of capital where people have to borrow to buy, the cost of capital is so difficult for people to, to, to take on. For example, buying a home today is 60% more expensive when you add, you know, the price appreciation and the mortgage costs. Like those big ticket item sales are falling at the fastest pace we've seen since 2008 despite a scarcity and burgeoning uh, burgeoning middle class. So we're, we're facing a dichotomy. And the easiest way to frame it is that, you know, the forces that we talked about earlier, and I apologize because everything's interconnected and it can be complicated. Um, when you have all these forces working at the same time, 
right? You have geopolitical situations which are causing inflation, which is causing interest rate increases. You had 2.9 million people retire early, which is causing structural unemployment, which the Fed doesn't seem to understand that is forcing its hand. And this higher cost of capital is hurting both international companies and domestic companies and is going to be lowering aggregate demand. And that de aggregate demand is hard to de decipher because you're looking at nominal terms and not real terms because no one reports in real terms. It's incredibly confusing. And what's what you should be thinking about is, OK, what companies have the ability to raise their prices and what companies do not have the ability to raise their prices? What companies are cyclical and what like semiconductors, industrials, and what companies are not cyclical? Defense contractors, even medical device contractors that benefit from lower inflation, where you can predict sales, you can look at and you know, and markets. So there's going to be the trades that you put on that did really well. Um, you know, buying the unprofitable tech in 2020, those trades all completely reversed, right? That was an easy trade to short those names. Then in 2021, the value trade going from 2021 to 2022, the value trade was really successful. And now I, I would argue that you have to be very selective in some of the value names like the industrials, like Caterpillar at all time highs, and not this is not a recommendation, but it frankly could be a short for the next two years, right? They had pent up demand, they had the highest pricing they've ever seen. You know, there is agricultural, de you know, demand for heavy machinery, right, was backed up. That may not be the case going forward. Some of these companies that have benefited that are value stocks that look optically cheap and have low PE multiples, where you saw very simply with, with uh, MU, right, with Micron. Micron was doing 17 billion of EBITDA and forward EBITDA is five. EPS was, you know, almost double digit. Now it's zero. Some of these companies that look like they have high earnings power that can change overnight when you enter a recession. So the question you should be asking outside of, okay, is the company cyclical or non-cyclical? Does that pricing power not have pricing power or remote? Is, you know, going forward, um, does the company, these, there are a few questions you need to ask. Does the company have a high debt to capitalization? So debt to market cap, debt to total cap, debt to EBITDA, debt to free cash flow. Um, you know, there are five different cash flow metrics. I think I posted something I emailed yesterday how to decipher different cash flow metrics and look at, um, and that helps you understand debt. You know, avoid companies that have a you know high level of debt. And this is something we're talking about the Tesla space. If a company's debt yield is opposed is approaching its equity yield or exceeds its equity yield, its debt and preferred securities can be a much better trade if you think the company is not going away than the equity securities. And that's something that I think has just been lost on Fintwit, and it's something that. We can follow. We can follow up on an, on on another space. But before I go into um, another tangent, I wanted to revert to Rosanna to see if there's another question or a comment. And I know that some people in the audience have questions. I I, mean, I am going to try to cut this space a little bit short because I have had to push dinner with my girlfriend because of this Tesla space. Uh, we haven't had dinner and it's been like four hours and she's knocking on my office door. So. You know, wanted to see for Rosanna if there's a couple of topics that you wanted to focus on. I, I I know I've been really fast and I went over a lot of topics really quickly for the sake of time here. But if there is something that you wanted to focus on, I'm happy to touch on it. Sure, great. I'll uh, combine a few parts into one. Now, I agree. Inflation works both ways. It's not just cost of goods sold and expenses. It's also revenues and raise prices, of course. So when we have inflation come down, which most likely seems to be in a pattern of a deceleration, hopefully it continues. And if we do see significant reduction in inflation into next year or the following year, we're also going to see those revenues come down as well. So what happens to the earnings? So my, um, you know, being I was a former CFO, I'm now CEO of a manufacturing company. I've been in the business world for 25 years. I've run multiple businesses. I'm a serial entrepreneur. I do financial statements all the time. So I'm seeing this in our business as well. We don't know that E. You know, we don't know. We're not sure about, you know, we revenues are upheld, not necessarily by higher output or volume, by, but raise prices. So next year could very well turn out to be an earnings recession. And that is what we're anticipating is sometime we already have compressed earnings. We already have compressed margins. 
And that's key here. We've had rise in the cost of goods sold and expenses. There's new fees since COVID. You know, even with my employment, I have IAS surcharges. I have new fees that have emerged. So um, we have margins compressed, and now we're going to see what happens into next year. So um, I guess labor market, if you could touch upon the labor market, are you concerned the Fed may be tightening um, to the point where we could have employment issues? Do you, in your perspective, Jay, do you see um, unemployment rising significantly higher? There's been a lot of disparities and, and inconsistencies with numbers. We see the Philly Fed, then we see the uh, household and employment surveys. There was a discussion, I actually tweeted about it back in August, how they utilize different methods that multiple job holders get counted multiple times if they appear on more than one. Oh, that is more. absolutely right. I have a funny story for you, Roseanne. Yeah, I'm happy I, you brought it up. Yeah, you know, that's very people... important. That's awesome. But go on, please. So I want to touch on that topic, and I want to touch on two related topics. Equity, the earnings recession, when I post, posted a graph about where consensus is going on the top of this space, and then two, on the yield curve. So employment, earnings recession, yield curve. Um, on the employment front, you know, during COVID, a very common thing to see, and I have nephews that work at big tech at Amazon and, and Facebook and other companies. One thing that they were seeing in their friend circles was that pe people were working three, four W-2 jobs and the background checks weren't picking this up. So the labor market looked a lot tighter than it really was. And then on this Philly Fed topic, I mean, the US government, Bureau of Labor Statistics, we won't figure this out till probably six months from now, um, but they were also overcounting, right? So there's a million plus jobs discrepancy. And, you know, I like to make fun of how, you know, the data out of the PBOC in China is completely fake. Well, you know, there, there are mistakes in the data we see in the U.S. as well. And some things are very misleading. PPI and CPI were also very misleading coming out of the recession. Um, so I do think that, one, I do believe that there's an overstatement in the number of jobs that are available. I think people, just like in the supply chain issues, when they went away really quickly, like people were over ordering. So here's a night. I mean, I know, Rosanna, you know this, but, you know, let's say you have to produce it, you know, 144 widgets per year, 12 per month. And you know that you don't have enough goods for the next three months. What do you do? You over order. So you order two or three times as much so that you can fill those orders. You know, you order instead of ordering tw 12 of the parts you need in the supply chain to build the widgets for next month, you order 24 or 36. Um, so that, you know, even if they're late, you know, your deliveries for month two, three, four, or five are going to be met. So that's what happened, you know, when it comes to semiconductors, people over ordered, and now you're seeing inventories build. And even with companies like Nike and Lululemon, people are focusing on their earnings beats. You look at their inventories, they're up like 80% year over year, and that you're going to see that impact margins next year. But that's another topic for another day. Um, when it comes to the labor market, so we think that the number of job postings is exaggerated. Um, but we, you know, whether it's 1.8 jobs open for every every individual looking or whether it's 1.6, we still have a tight labor economy. So I, I think that we're at a risk of, you know, misinformation and the job might, market might be a little bit looser than it, than it is. But I still think that unemployment is going to be under 5% for the next several months. And that gives the Fed the ability to, to continue hiking, at least for the immediate future. I also think that, for example, we have PC tomorrow um, and we have CPI in Jan before the February Fed meeting. Um, I do think that on the goods inflation side, you're going to see things come down. And, you know, you just look at WTI, right? Look at energy, look at used car prices, look at all the sales you saw this holiday season. You know, it, last year, there, were, there weren't that many discounts to be seen. And today, you know, if you walked into a Gap or a TJ Maxx, um, there's more flexibility, right? Things were things were were cheaper. There's more incentives to buy. There, you know, the cashier is pushing their the company credit card on you harder than they were in 2021 when their store was completely filled to the brim. So I do think that you know on the retail front, you know, the U.S. because of excess savings has been very very strong. But I think going into 2020, you're starting to see signs. You're starting to see signs even in travel. And travel was like the recovery trade, right? You look at JetBlue's disclosures last week, also Alaska Airlines, a couple other airlines, they're starting to see travel at the lower end of their December guidance. So JetBlue was looking at 19% 
um, growth and, and I think they came in 15 or sub 15. So um, what this is pointing to is the consumer is strong, savings are high, but we think that the labor market is a little bit looser than what is being shared to us in the data. And, you know, but despite that, we think it's going to take, um, because of the forced retirements of 2.9 million people, half a million deaths, and lack of immigration. It takes, I heard a story of an Indian programmer. It took him 17 years. He worked at a top tier company. He had uh, two degrees. It took him 17 years uh, to become a citizen and well over 12 years to get his green card. I mean, listen, this is a country of immigrants. You have the smartest, you have the best institutions, best universities in the world. Um, it should be easier to get qualified people in this country. And that's one of the reasons why, you know, People out of college were making two, three hundred thousand dollars with sign-on bonus relocation. You know, a year or two out of college at companies like Facebook, and that you know, and and you saw these Instagram videos about people just drinking coffee and hanging out all day, not really contributing to the company. I know that's exaggerated, but you, to, the conclusion on your question is, we think the labor market is very tight. We think that it is loosening and is likely looser than the, the data shows, but it will take you know several months. Um, if not over a year to see unemployment break above uh, five, six percent, which is where I think the Fed would start getting worried um, on the earnings front. We think that I think we said last year that we expect consensus S&P 500 earnings to fall to 190. I think at that time we were around 250. I posted a graph up top here and believe it or not, Morgan Stanley, Goldman Sachs, B of A, everybody was was pointing to higher earnings in 2023, and we couldn't understand why. Um, in a in a global coordinated tightening environment, well, how earnings would be going up, but that has been corrected. You see in this graph that consensus earnings estimates have come down a tad below from 250 to under 230 today, and we think that you know they could we could very well see an another 10 15 percent decline in EPS. Now. If it wasn't for the inflation component, we would stand pat on our 190. We think, you know, low 200s, given how much companies have been able to increase pricing, is still probable. And, you know, you look at the S&P 500 today at 3,800, you know, you take, you know, 3,800 and you divide that by, you know, 205, um, and you still get a, a forward earnings multiple of 18 and a half. You know, with forward rates at four and a half percent, that is not cheap. Um, especially going into recession, you know, there we think that there's going to be consider considerable volatility um, in the market and that companies that are cyclical are frankly going to underperform. And, you know, we used to have arguments on like why AMD, you know, can't I used to say like, hey, AMD can be down 50 percent. People be like, why? It's the greatest company since sliced bread. It's growing at this. And my retort to that was like, I didn't say it was a bad company, but it is a cyclical company that is trading at a high multiple on high peak earnings. And you, it's, it, it frustrated me that people couldn't understand that, you know, the earnings don't go through a straight, on a straight line, the same way that people didn't understand that SaaS companies, not every SaaS company is a monopoly. If they were, they would eventually, you know, be bigger than the world's GDP. What, what likely happens with these companies is they encroach on each other's TAMs and not every company in that space is a monopoly. So there are a lot of truths that people just didn't seem to comprehend. And this v this VC type thinking, you know, revenue at all costs, market share all, at all costs, it really backfired. And people ended up paying, you know, 10, 15, 20 times um, what a company was actually worth on a forward cash flow basis. So we do think we're going to enter an earnings recession. An earnings recession doesn't necessarily mean stock prices are going to go down, by the way. Um, I think it earlier in the cycle, yes, it does. But what you will see probably sometime next year, it could be the year after, is that the market will rally before earnings bottom. So an earnings recession is negative. Don't get me wrong. Where we are today, an earnings recession is negative and it's not been priced in. However, before earnings actually bottom, whether it's the second or third quarter or fourth quarter or first quarter of 2024, second quarter of 2024, the market will be front running that and the Fed will have cut interest rates Bef well before um, earnings actually do bottom. So that is something to to keep in mind. And before we go to our sector and con constituents, we just don't have a lot of time to go to spend more time on this. So we're going to shift shift to the third part of the question, which is the, the U.S. Treasury yield curve. Um, so what people, um, there are a lot of talking heads, and I think this is the first year we've, we've talked, to, we were in a 40-year bond bull market. And I think this is the first time 
um, people have actually cared about bonds. Um, you know, what people should understand is you can go today to PNC Bank and earn 4% in a high yield savings account. And I haven't seen anything like that in over 15 years. So you can buy T-Flow today, floating rate treasuries earn over 4%. You can buy AAA security ETFs and earn six percent, and you know those are just some, those are returns that you simply couldn't see. You can lock in a five-year CD at well over four percent today, so that when inflation does you know does drop, you know you could be locking in a positive yield, uh, positive real return, real return. And that's just a public service. If you don't know that, you should know that. Um, you know, keeping your money at B of A and Chase and letting them get away with paying you zero is absolute murder. Um, a yield curve is a line that plots yields or interest rates of bonds having equal credit quality by differing maturity dates. So the common yield curve we talk about is US Treasury yield curve, and that's our risk-free. And you know, you, you talk about you can talk about the front of the curve, one month, three months, six months bills, and you can talk about you know the 30-year bond or the long bond. And the shape of that curve is dependent on the pace of the economic growth, nominal and real growth that's that's expected. And you can also have yield curves for credits. You know, you can you can plot a yield curve for you know Apple credit or Hertz credit or any company that where you have the same credit rating or a municipality, a muni, uh, state of New York, state of California. You can plot their yield curve. When the yield curve is upward sloping, right? That is a healthy yield curve. And it's also an environment where banks do really well. They borrow at the short end of the yield curve at the sh in the short end of the funding market at a very low rate. And then they make longer term loans, five-year, 10-year, 15-year mortgages, 30-year mortgages, and they make that spread. They lever it up 10 times. That's your ROE. You know, That's your Wells Fargo, Bank of America, Citigroup. That's how they make money when yield curves are positive. When yield curves are flat to negative, it means that the forward outlook on growth is negative, that you're potentially going to be entering a recession and the Fed is going to have to do policy easing or cut rates. The shape of the yield curve in November was, you know, the steepest inversion that I've seen in a very long time. I think we were 85 bips inversion, whether you looked at two tens or the three month versus the 30 year, we were very inverted. And what that means is that, you know, the bond market, which is much bigger than the equity market consensus, and it doesn't have to be right, but the consensus was that we were going to be entering a recession in 2023 and 2024. Now, the data that we've been seeing in the PMIs and the ISM, which are forward-looking metrics, right? Diffusion indices that look at CEO confidence and hiring and ordering, those types of uh, metrics are already pointing to a decline um, across various cities in the United States. You're seeing similar data in China and Europe. Um, but when it comes to the actual the lagging data, employment, you know, wages, you know, wages seem to be peaking, but um, or the wage growth seems to be peaking. But a lot of the lagging indicators that the Fed is using um, tend to be getting tighter and tighter and tighter. In fact, the labor market data today, I think the market sold off for three reasons today. Or, well, obviously more than three reasons, but three reasons the market sold off today were that you know GDP came in and it's a lagging indicator for the last quarter 3Q at 3.2% versus expectations of 2.9%. Um, core, core PCE uh, quarter over quarter came in at 4.7% versus 4.6%. Um, <clears throat> the PCE, the, the more important PCE metrics, the deflator is coming out tomorrow at 830, by the way. We'll talk about that in a second. And initial jobless claims came in at 216,000 versus 220. Uh, 22,000. And so all these lagging metrics showed that um, they're all looking at the last quarter that the market was um, getting tighter in the third quarter. And that gives the Fed more wiggle room to cut, uh, to, to hike. And why does the Fed want to hike so quickly? Um, we're all focusing on the obvious things on inflation. We think the underpinning here is that the Fed wanted to jack up and slow down the economy very quickly. One, so that inflation expectations, and you'll see um, UMish sentiment and inflation expectations reported tomorrow at 10 a.m. Eastern Standard. But you'll see that they're very focused on inflation expectations and wages and whether this becomes self-fulfilling. Um, but also, they're focused on the fact that, you know, the fact that the $8 trillion of bonds at the Fed, okay, um, and the $30 trillion of debt we have, the majority of that is at the front end of the curve. Over the next three years, over a third of our debt is going to roll over and mature at much, much higher rates. 
which is going to put much a uh, much higher burden. The percentage of our taxes that go into interest rates is going to increase very materially. So it's in the best interest of the Fed to hike rates really quickly, right? And then cut them in, you know, 2024, you know, before it becomes a really big problem. So you can take rates, you know, to 5% and then cut them to, you know, to three in 2024. And, it, you know, it doesn't really matter as much, right? You don't have to, it doesn't become a burden from that perspective. Um, so I liked, you know, to, before we get to Q&A and wrapping this up, um, everyone tends to live in the church of what's working now. I've noticed like in Wall Street, everyone tends to be myopically focused on what's happening in the present. So like in March and April, May of 2021, when I had just started to short SPACs and was looking at inflation as being a problem, everyone was like, inflation, what are you talking about? We haven't had inflation in 30 years and, you know, Dogecoin to the moon and I'm buying pictures of monkeys and, and selling my home. Like it was absolutely bananas. Like I'd never seen anything like that since 1999. And, you know, today everyone's like, oh, whoa, I know I Googled Volcker and I read a Wikipedia article on Volcker and we can have inflation for 10 years and we can have three periods of inflation and the world is going to end and buy gold. And it's like, dude, you live through like one year of inflation. Like, here's a gold medal. Like, I don't understand. You know, what do you want? Like, we're in a, a period, you know, we're at a time in the world where, you know, <laughs> I don't know if you're there's some people that are ha are very invested in what they own so maybe they're gold bugs or energy bugs or whatever but you're looking at the data you're looking at shipping rates go negative to where they were in 2019 you are seeing goods prices in certain sectors like there is there are going to be oversupplies in in apparel there are going to be oversupplies in tv panels and computers you're already seeing it in handset devices which is why you know, we were negative on, on Qualcomm and the semis, they're going to be over, there is going to be, you're going to see inventories at the highest levels in three years, sometime next year in various sectors. And for people to say that, oh, inflation is going to last forever. I mean, just like we were worried about inflation in 2021, you know, we're still worried about inflation, but we are not terrified to the point where I think a lot of the media has brainwashed, you know, a large percent of the population. Um, and if it makes them conservative, good for you, because, you know, like even Elon said in our space, if you can make five, 10 percent or 15 percent, if you're doing good work in securities that don't have equity risk, why not? It should force people to take money out of the equity markets. Um, but. You know, I'd like to open this up. I know Sid has his hand up. Shiv is on here. Nostra is on here. AJ Capital is on here. Captain's on here. Um, wanted to briefly go through questions. We're going to try to keep this to like nine o'clock because, um, you know, haven't you know had a haven't had dinner and my girlfriend's getting very hangry. Um, but um, but Rosanna, thank you for hosting this. You know, love to do some Q and A and then maybe do another space where we dig more dig deeper. This has been more of Sounds great. you know yeah. touch on everything and. I know I've tried to touch on the questions you had, but I know we haven't been able to answer every single one. No worries at all. We'll look forward to doing a part two on this. And I'd love to discuss the, the various asset classes, commodities, fixed income, credit. Um, if we have time, we can talk about them a little bit. But yes, let's take sure. Sid. Sid, I see you have your hand up. Why don't you go ahead, please? Hey, th th thank you, Rosanna, for hosting this. And Jay, lots of good insights. I learned a lot. So quick question for you. Uh, and you touched on this a uh, little bit towards the end that, you know, just because earning is shrinking doesn't necessarily mean that the stock market further are going to collapse or go down. So if I take a 5,000 feet or 10,000 feet view, even during a uh, financial crisis, uh, if I just take NASDAQ, 2008, I think 40% down, then that was it. Like 2009, 10, we kept growing. Obviously, there are a lot of money flowing. Uh, in during dot com bubble, well, well, in two thousand nine, right? You had first of all, in in both those periods, in two thousand two, two thousand three, and in two thousand nine, you had the Federal Reserve easing very, very right. dramatically. Right, right, and and in the dot com bubble, I think we had like two thousand, two thousand one, and two thousand two in Nasdaq forty percent, twenty percent, thirty percent down. It was horrible, right? How do you see this time is playing out? We are down 33% in NASDAQ, right? I'm as, as an investor, equity investor, I'm just- You want to hear something that. funny? I yeah, don't think ahead. the percentage matters. Like I was in a space okay. today where someone was talking to me about, oh, well, Tesla's down 70% from the high. Like, 
that's it, right? Like, I was like, well, I don't know. What is that based on? I was short Carvana. It was down 50% from the high, then 60% from the high, then 70% from the high, then 90% from that. Now it's down 98% from the highs. I don't know, hmm. right? Like, I think some of these percentages and technicals that people use um, tend to be very arbitrary. And yeah. I think what matters more is nobody will know the exact percentage that the market hmm. will fall. What yeah. really matters is is consensus expectations for rates priced into the market Two, what is the path of earnings decline for for developed markets and emerging markets for next year those are the questions that you will be focused you should be focusing on and what asset classes and sector should i be long and what should i be short how should i be positioned your sector your sector positioning is going to drive 70 percent of your your returns you can't like, I love how fund managers will tell you, oh, well, I'm going to be up this percentage of your year, this is my track record, or this is what you expect. There's no way for you to know that. No one can tell the future. All you can do is position for it. Yeah. So honestly, <laughs> you, you know, I know it's kind of leading into your question. I don't know whether it's going to be 40, whether the NASDAQ can be down 40, 50, 60 percent or or whether it will recover in two months. Yeah, I, I, I think you, you are absolutely right. I understand Carvana. And the, I mean, it, it, obviously, we look at indexes, right? Everybody looked at index, right? Even like an S&P 500, right? It's just not those uh, those risky companies with no profit and Carvana and that side of the world. But we do put some weight on S&P, right? Uh, you know, there is 500 best companies in there. So from that point of view, I was just thinking, okay, if the S&P go down, uh, you know, like 2000, 2001 and 2002, then, you know, it's going to be really horrible. And if you say that, don't look at this, just focus on a specific asset. I get it. Right. Uh, but pe people in general who is investing, they look at in the indices. Right. There is no denying the first thing you wake up in the morning. You look at indexes. Right. So oh, 100 percent. You look at futures. So if you were to ask me, you know, if you put a gun to my head, I think it is realistic to see s p breach 3500 and my worst my low case outside of a severe recession would be like 32 33 um but you know that's that's my gut instinct based on what my views are for 190 to 205 of earnings but there's certain sectors that can get completely blown out right there's certain cyclical industrial sectors where stocks are close to all-time highs those stocks could be down 80 percent 50 percent 60 percent and you might see some tech stocks or defense or long duration stocks actually rally with expectations of the of the tech coming in, especially the higher quality ones, offsetting some of those declines. So, you know, the index level could be the index level, but the un the underlying sectors and stocks, those moves could be like completely different than what you expect with an index move. Okay. Thank you. Yep. And by the way, you know, whether those those levels if we ever touch those, we may not, but that's kind of my, like, I tend to focus more on downside than upside in periods like this. And that's kind of how I am, uh, I'm thinking about it, right? If, if earnings expectations all of a sudden came down 15, 10, 15, 20%, the market would definitely be, you know, would be materially lower from here um, is how I'm thinking about it in the short term. Yeah. Thank you. Jay. Real Thank quick you. How do you feel about a stock like United Health Group, like those healthcare stock is almost all time high still. Do you see that they're going to be correction on them or they're still going to be, you know, uh, pretty resilient going forward another one, two years un until then inflation comes down significantly? Well, you're talking about defensive names and good companies. The issue is that like someone asked me about like a data storage stock today. And I was like, dude, you're talking to me to the, about this stock and it has a 2.8% dividend yield. Like, it doesn't make any sense. Like it might be a good company and the comps might be okay. And with UNH, right? Like Medicare Advantage is growing and a number of the business lines are growing. But, you know, if the Fed were to hike more than 5% and they were to go long, in, in, you know, with 25 basis point increments and they were to go for longer, eventually, you know, some of these um, stocks with, you know, sub 3% dividend yields, um, if the perception was that, the Fed was in a hike for longer, some of these names would sell off um, and people would rotate out of some of the defensive names and it would actually happen more um, when the market w comes to a realization that we are in a recession and the Fed is going to cut. You actually saw that a couple of times earlier this fall when um, defensive sharply underperformed. There are a couple of days where like the healthcare names were down like three, four, five percent in a day and the um, 
you know, and, you know, more cyclical names are rallying or more, you know, longer duration tech names are rallying. Like that could really happen. You could have like money has to go somewhere, right? Right now there's a lot of crowding in defensive names and industrials and energy. Um, if all of a sudden for Outlook, all of a, you know, Powell comes and says something about, I don't expect this, but if, if he comes out very dovish, you could actually see healthcare sell off and, you know, another part of the equity sector benefit. So um, just because the stock is defensive doesn't mean it has to continue to outperform, if that's, if that's your question. Very nice. Thank you. Anyone else have any questions? I don't see any more hands up. AJ, oh. Ryan. Oh, bar chart. Tom, please go What's ahead. Up? Rosanna, you know, you know, hey. I don't speak too often, but I'm, I'm going to make a special occasion <laughs> tonight. Oh, I love it. I love that you're here. My favorite web website for stocks and options. Love Appreciate it. That. Please yeah, go on. Hey, JM, I've seen a bit more chatter lately about 2023 being a great year for precious metals like gold and silver. And I'm wondering if you share the same belief for that and, and also if you have any thoughts on you know whether the u.s dollar has topped out at least temporarily or if you think it's going to be kind of in a longer term downtrend sure that's a great question and i'd like to take a step back and say gold and silver um you know have they're both precious metals they have industrial uses and they have financial uses and you should really be focusing on real interest rates um if you don't know what real interest rates are, you can, like I say every time, you can you can Google it and look at real interest rates over time. You're essentially looking at a nominal interest rate minus inflation expectations. When real interest rates fall, okay, um, gold does tends to do well, okay. And in the past, that hadn't been the case because of substitutes like crypto. And you think that the crypto bubble had a lot. I mean, you've been seeing in the news every day. The, you know, institutional confidence isn't really there. I don't expect it to come back anytime soon. So I expect if real interest rates come down and the dollar has peaked, it is a better environment for gold and silver um, than it has been for the last two years. And there, there are ways to express that view through physical, through ETFs, through you can, you can uh, buy coins, you can buy miners if you want more operating leverage. A lot of the miners have reduced their debt very materially. I would avoid a lot of the speculative junior miners that don't generate any cash flow. Um, it's a way that you could get hurt if your thesis is wrong. Um, but hopefully that that answers your question. I think that there are a couple of things that you know could could push the dollar lower. I think that Kuroda is leaving the Bank of Japan. And despite all the crap we talk about, the secular decline in Japan and the 250% debt to GDP, the banking system in Japan, you know, Naruchin, you know, Japan Post, uh, Mitsubishi, um, these the Japanese banks take the lowest risk, right? So there's, they have some of the cleanest balance sheets in the world, and the yen tends to actually strengthen in a recession. The yen and, the, and, and to a lesser extent, the dollar. So... If the yen strengthens more than the dollar or, you know, these bands continue to widen and Kuroda's policy, you know, there's a new central bank governor bank in the Bank of Japan. We've already seen it happen uh, at the margin, right? The widening of the band wasn't because, you know, all of a sudden overnight, the Bank of Japan said, oh, you know, we like what the Fed is doing. We want to do that. No, absolutely not. It was because they had no choice. They own like 62% of, of the 10-year JGBs. And with the rest of the world tightening, it was becoming harder and harder. They had to blow more and more of the reserves to the point where the market started speculating that the yen would go to 200. And it frankly almost touched 160. And now it's snapped back, you know, 15, 20% in the period of a month. And that's how sensitive, um, you know, the market was to the fact that you know the Bank of Japan was eating while, easing while the rest of the world is tightening. Now, we think in 2023, there is a risk that the Bank of Japan is kind of forced um, to tighten further when they reach their inflation perspective, their 20, their 2% inflation target for the first time in 30 years. Um, and you have a situation where the yen continues to strengthen versus the dollar um, as, as we enter a global recession. That could put, and expectations of the Fed cutting rates would also put more pressure on the dollar. So in that environment where the dollar declines, commodities rally. And if there's a perception that inflation is coming down at the same time that forward rates are coming down, 
um, and inflation is coming down um, at a faster rate, then you could have real rates. Um, um, you, you could have a situation where, um, you know, you could have a change in real rates. Um, and I think it's misspoke a little bit, but you could have a situation where real rates are coming, uh, coming down. Um, and because gold doesn't generate any yield, when real rates come down, um, gold and silver tend to rally. Silver tends to have a, a higher beta to gold. So, you know, that's just a quick summary um, on, on it. Great. Thanks, Jay. I love that. Yeah, no I'm, I'll add my two cents. I trade gold and silver futures, actually, um, contracts into next year. I've been doing that. So to me, you can do the ETF. I, like Jay said, you could do the actual um, material of themselves. Um, but I, I like, just going to add my two cents, I like the futures trading um, for the commodities with contracts into next year. And I've been successful lately with that. And I will look to continue doing that into next year on dips. Uh, I'll probably be trading them or you can hold long term. That's my style. That's my trading. Not a buy recommendation, but that's just my opinion on that. So I just wanted to add that. Thank you. Um, I just no want to, to correct myself. If, for example, um, rates were to come down and, and real rates were to come negative, um, that would be positive for gold and precious yeah. metals. Um, Nostra has had his. Yes, Nostra. Uh, hey, guys. Uh, Jay. Uh, you touched on the yen, and my question is: um, We saw the Bank of Japan expand the, the the range of the yield curve by forty basis points, but it was twenty five on the upside, and we had a magnified move in FX. So my question is: Do you do you believe that if the Bank of Japan were to further extend um, the, the range of the yield curve? Uh, we'll get a much more magnified move in FX, and how would that affect the carry trade? Because I feel so, like there's a lot so of people. This was who are a short. this was a move that I think people didn't understand, and I think you know when the band was moved um, on Japanese bonds. I mean, it was it was obvious to me that I mean the first thing that would happen would be that yields would go to the the upper to the upper band. Um, so I don't think that you can interpret that move as anything outside of that. You know, when somebody moves a moves a band and they're saying, well, we're still buying bonds, but we're buying bonds at X yield. Obviously, it's going to go to that yield. Why would you buy? Why would you buy a bond at a higher price than the Bank of Japan is buying bonds? So I think that interpreting anything more than that is speculation. But we do healthy speculation. And I think that, you know, there will likely be, you know, the Bank of Japan will likely be forced to to do a couple other things um, on the path to tighten, but as of today, they're still buying bonds, but at a at a you know wider range, and that essentially gives them more breathing room, so they don't have to buy back as many bonds as quickly. Do you think that uh, the, the the surprise move from the BOJ might um, scare some of the speculators out of their short yen position or their carry trade? Oh, hundred percent. The speed of it was. A lot of it was probably due to short covering. Um, there was a, a lot of, uh, there's aggressive shorting. They're big macro guys. They're openly talking about their short yen positions um, just two or three months ago. And, you know, part of that, that snapback could have been that. That's why our view is like, you know, and don't, don't rely on these levels. I'm not a Forex trader, but I wouldn't be surprised if the yen gets to 120. And you're like, well, that's not very much for, you know, but the line, you know, I think the, a large part of the move has already happened because of short covering. It just forced the move to happen faster. Um, but, you know, that tends, tends to, you know, I tend to agree. Unfortunately, people that had been expecting this, you know, probably missed the majority of the move. Um, the speed of it was because of the the positioning and we see that you know in commodities trading and fx you know you tend to have you tend to have positionings one-sided and uh you also saw that with oil right positioning went from you know went from very bullish to slightly negative and you know you can look at the cftc data and all of a sudden you know Oil's trading almost below 70, almost where almost where Biden said he was going to be buying for the SPR. And it took a lot of people by surprise. So you have to be really careful when you're trading futures. Um, when it comes to commodities and FX, you need to have stops. It's something that I, I don't do because I, I, you know, I, I like to do research and and do things 
uh, with less leverage, but you really need to, to, if you're doing that type of trading, you need to be very, very careful. Things move fast and things move quickly. Absolutely. And uh, like you said, with oil, especially and in this market, things keep, there are a lot of moving parts. So, you know, Ryan, you've had your hand up on and off. So can we go to captain? Yeah. yeah. Absolutely. First, I want to say thanks for coming on, Jay. It's always nice to hear what you have to say. Um, I was wondering what your thoughts are going with oil. You, I know you just uh, brought oil up in the SPR. That was going to be my question. If you thought the, they were going to fill the SPR anytime soon and what your views are going into 2023 with oil. Yeah, I think it will, it will really depend on how fast and how deep the recession is. Um, we all know the supply and demand numbers. We know, you know, what the world consumes. We know what OPEC produces, what non-OPEC produces. So it becomes a simple argument where if supply, you know, if supply and demand is offsides by two to three million barrels of oil, that can move oil 30 bucks a barrel. So it's very, very sensitive to that. Um, but I, what, what I will say is um, the, the China reopening is just not played out as people have expected. And that's one of the reasons why there's been pressure on Brent and WTI. Um, we think that there's a risk that COVID could rampage, you know, the country and the zero COVID policy was not sustainable, but G did the best he could till he was made Supreme Lord and dictator and their five-year plans had been set in stone. Um, and we're headed into Chinese New Year. It's the busiest time of the year. And I would I would say that there is a high probability that just like in India, just like the U.S., um, people that have been quarantined by three years will get it. I was extremely careful, did all the right things because I'm slightly older and have some medical stuff going on. And I still got it. And I knew I was going to get it. It was just a matter of time. And because of the lack of, you know, the ego of G and the lack of foreign vaccines in their country, I think there's a chance that you see COVID, you know, roll through every province in China and delay the recovery by a few months. And that's, that's really important because we might be in a global, you know, in a very obvious global recession um, by the middle of next year. So if the Chinese recovery is delayed by too long, right, you might not get that big bump in demand right away that everyone was looking for. Um, so that you know that the you know the fact that the dollar has declined so materially right the the dollar is down double digits right from from the highs and in that type of an environment for oil not to outperform just shows you how worried people are about demand and that's you know that's with you know one OPEC cut i know the headline was 2 million but the reality was like 800,000 barrel cut that's with an oil cut um so i think that there will be <clears throat> a lot of volatility in the energy space. And there are a lot of ways to play it. You know, we've been playing it, you know, in June when we had the 40% sell off in oil, instead of just going balls to the wall, we started building conservative positions in MLPs, midstream companies that we thought had sold off for no reason, that don't have ex as much exposure to price. And we're not only buying them, but buying them through closed end funds at, you know, 20, 30% discount to net asset value. And they're paying like 10% dividends. So, you know, they all rallied 30%, you know, and the fund discounts tightened. And that was a great trade. And we did that same trade again in September. And we're doing that same trade again now. And, you know, we've done 11 trades in the natural gas space, both in companies and in the underlying commodity. We think that, you know, going into January, it, you know, it's a widow maker. And once winter is over, you don't want to be involved. You know, the natural gas is a commodity that you really have to be, you call it a widow maker for a reason and you trade it when um, it's in periods of high demand, not in shoulder season, not in the spring and not in the fall. But um, when it comes to, you know, we played crack spreads and we were long refiners earlier in the year. We saw the highest refining spreads we've seen of all time um, due to, you know, perception of a lack of refining capacity in certain parts of the world. Um, it's undeniable. I know people have different views on that, but spreads wouldn't have been that high if that wasn't the case. Um, and some of these refining companies were earning, you know, 30 plus percent free cash flow yields. Um, we think that crack spreads have come down a lot and, you know, gasoline demands a lot down a lot. It'll likely come down further. You can track um, miles driven at the Department of Transportation's website. 
And our view is that, you know, gasoline demand is going to come down in 2023 with the recession. Um, diesel demand has stayed high because of uh, winter demand. But, you know, if there's a manufacturing recession in the U.S. next year, don't count on as, you know, on as sharp of a distillate shortage. But that's all talking about, you know, current supply and demand. Uh, taking a broader step back, we do have lower inventories in across the energy um, spectrum the lowest inventories we've had in several years. So if we do come out of this recession quickly and we go back to operating at, you know, full capacity and global economic growth goes back to, you know, four or 5% plus, we'll be at a situation where, um, you know, without the CapEx spending that we're seeing because of ESG issues, you could have another spike in oil um, and gas in 2024. Um, especially if we have a cold winter. So I'm kind of positioning now I've de-risked and I'm looking to next winter and, you know, looking at the data right now to see, okay, how severe do I think next that the recession is going to be? And, you know, right now playing energy through kind of closed end fund ARP, but taking big outright positions in energy, I'm waiting, you know, further in 2023 and want to react once I have more data. Excellent. Thank you so much. Now we're going to go to the French existentialist. Uh, there he is. Sartre, please go ahead. Hey, um, appreciate this. Um, Jay, if I can ask a question here and, and just bear with me, because I'm going to try to tie your um, what you've been talking about um, from geopolitical oil to the macro with interest rates into equities and see, see if this aligns. Um, I'm not sure if you've read any of Zoltan's last few pieces, but, you know, he's got some pretty strong views along this, like, Brenton Woods, China, Middle, you know, Middle East, Saudi, Russia alliance. Um, and it, Is this along the lines of deglobalization? Yeah, I mean, I'm not, I don't really buy that as much, but I think, I think, you know, you're from Goldman, you know, based on your bio, and, you know, the Goldman's famous for... I don't work there yeah, anymore, yeah, but, but go ahead. Yeah, I know you're not, you're not there anymore. I'm just saying Goldman wrote a book on commodities a way back called... Uh, it's called fuel, feed, and food. And essentially, you know, fuel is sort of the depressiveness for all inflationary pressures. And I'm just trying to think of like, you know, these are all interconnected things that we view in separate sectors. And, and unfortunately, banks cover them separately and so do the investors, but they all kind of make the economy work one way or another. So like, if we kind of have this alliance between the Middle East, Russia, you know, we're not solving right now for that much net export of oil. It's like, you know, one and a half million barrels from Russia is what we're looking at per day. That could be solved with some OPEC and, and U.S., you know, production coming online. But it doesn't seem that it's happening this time where Saudi is really not kind of playing along with the U.S.'s, uh, you know, political agenda here. So I think the question is, is that like if oil, you know, if the oil market remains fractured, as you pointed out correctly, like, we're not seeing the ramp up on even domestic. We're at like 740 something onshore rigs versus a peak of like 4,200, I think in like 2015. Um, so we're not even close. Well, also rigs are a lot more productive than they are today. Yeah. On And when it comes to Saudi, just like India, you know, India relies on Russia for weapons in the military industrial complex. Yeah. Saudi relies on the US for weapons. Yeah. So yeah. They were pissed off at us in the short term because we said but we, what Biden said about Khashoggi. Yeah. But when push comes to shove, you know, Saudi's not going to want to buy crappy, you know, outdated Russian military equipment. Yeah. And Russia's low on all that stuff anyway. Yeah, they they want to buy. Uh, yeah, they, they need to buy it from the U.S. Yeah. So they depend on us no, uh, for our technology. I get it. I'm just trying to like I'm with you. I think the economic pressure from U.S. and global is, is under attack right now like we're, we're really in a deflationary environment i think that it's just the fed's looking at backwards data but they seem so hell-bent on looking at sort of the inflationary pressures which i think is is been mostly driven by the short-term you know ukraine russia oil kind of spike which then fed into food and i think it's kind of that came on the tail end of sort of that what's interesting talk to anybody who is long we w-e-t yeah who has lost like, you know, 20% in four weeks, yeah, right? Very like similar. when, when, when Russia opened up, you know, you 40% of the world's grain, corn, wheat comes from Ukraine and, um, you know, Russia, you know, when you think about commodities, 
I think people make a mistake when they think about U.S. versus Saudi and U.S. versus Russia. Mm -hmm. That's not the case. It's OPEC is managing expectations from every emerging market in the world. Um, you know, if you were to, to, you know, to talk to the prime minister of India and Modi and say that oil prices were going to go up 40 percent, the guy would have like the guy would collapse. Right. Like Indians earn seven thousand five hundred dollars a year. Yeah. They cannot afford, you know, like a 40 percent increase. So it's not it's not the U.S. versus OPEC. It's, you know, OPEC, unfortunately, has has to deal with these poor nations are the biggest growth drivers of demand. No, no, I, they care a lot I, less about the West I, I, than they care about China and India and Vietnam and Indonesia. I hundred percent agree with you. I think what, what the U S is kind of saying and Yellen has kind of given the green light is that India is a hundred percent allowed to continue buying Russian oil at the cap and then mark it up and sell it to Europe in the interim. But I guess what I'm trying to get at is that like, if there's, you know, the cap is kind of set at Russia's break-even price, right? It's meant to be punitive because they're kind of at a break-even around 60. But so India, as you mentioned, the emerging market countries are going to buy it at the cap price. So is, and so is Xi, right? And the question is, is like, is it dollar back? Or is it UN back? Is it RMD? And I think the question, like, that's where you're kind of seeing a dollar weakness, I think, also come in because – you know, the Brent has been measured in dollar, you know, everywhere. And now we're kind of seeing different, um, you know, Russia's trying to play games, I think, with gold to some extent, which Zoltan is kind of alluded yeah, to. I think they're doing it on the margin. Yeah. I think you're right. But I think the petrodollar is going to stay for the next several years. I don't years. disagree. I mean, it's too hard to do with gold longer yeah. term. The question, though, is, and I'm sorry for be taking so much long, and I appreciate you bearing with me, is, if the pressure, if there's upward pressure on oil prices, which you seem to be, like, alluding to, right, that will keep some of core inflation a bit elevated. Well, oil's not core. Sorry, headline, oil's sorry. not part of core, headline, core inflation. Headline will be elevated. We'll see it seep into you know food and, and, and energy and heating will be a little bit elevated. Well, I think what I meant was I'm more worried about next winter. Okay. I am less worried about the short term because the short term is going to be driven by perception of economic growth slowing. But if we had another cold winter with the low inventories we have now, and you see Baker Hughes rig counts fall every week, like mm -hmm. we saw for the, you know, for the first time in the last couple of weeks, and there's limited capex, we could be setting up for, you know, a multi-year tightness in Oil. the sector. But in the short term, I am not, I'm not as worried. Right until we get to driving season, I'm not, I'm not like. Basically until June, right? Okay. I'm not really going to be that worried about oil. So on, on, that, on that point then, then where do we see the inflation data come in to kind of give Fed, the Fed and, and really all central banks? Because like my expectation, if you're right, then we should see a much steeper fall off because we've had this inventory. Glut. Oh, yeah. By April of next year, I think we come down 200 basis points okay. in nominal inflation. And some of that is already being priced in for the next CPI. But I think that, you know, we could be getting, you know, PCE with a five, you know, with a low five handle and CPI with like, with a six handle. Tomorrow? I guess my 200 basis points was from, was from, um, from a couple months ago, because I've been saying this for a while. But I think that um, by April, you'll be seeing, you know, a 200 basis point decline in CPI from October. Or more. So, and it's just, it's not just the fact that these prices are coming down. It's because of the year over year effects. Yeah. You look at, you know, how fast CPI ramped in the fourth quarter of last year. We're coming against that now. That's one of the reasons why CPI is falling, not just because of the fact that gasoline prices are a little bit lower and used car prices are down 2.8% in the month. Um, so when you look at, you know, when we lap the Ukraine war, and you you know, and you look at March and April. By April next year, food and food and oil prices are actually going to be looking. They're actually going to. They might even go. You know, negative, negative year over year. Yeah. Hey, uh, Jay, could you touch on the housing market a little bit? Uh, how do you how do you see it unfolding? Right, you know. Yeah, um, and oh, we've been going on a little bit longer than I wanted. So this is the last question. Um, and then I'm just going to do a quick wrap up, but the housing market, I think that I'm the most worried about commercial real estate. So I'm worried about office. Um, 
you know, we've seen some of the changes in employment and people going to work be permanent. And when you look at like lower quality office, you know, and you look at some of the lower quality real estate, like class B and C malls um, that got a boost with, with uh, the easy money policies, I think commercial real estate is at uh, the most risk. So I'd avoid REITs associated with commercial real estate. I'd avoid securitizations associated with commercial real estate. I also think that single family housing is going to come down for three reasons in the US. One is obviously interest rates. Two is um, decline in savings. Three um, is, you know, the lack of, um, of Airbnb. So a lot of the travel and a lot of the money that people, there's been a lot of investor, uh, both institutional investors, but also individual investors buying, uh, fam buying single family homes, converting them, buying homes, converting them into Airbnbs. It was driven by a lot of domestic travel during COVID. You know, now that the world is opening up, we think that, um, you know, the, the day rates that people were charging and the fact that the cleaning fees are so high and hotel rates are so low, um, is going to make the environment more competitive and it's going to be less attractive to set up those businesses. So certain areas of the market, we think like Florida is going to be adversely impacted. Certain parts of California are going to be adversely impacted. It's going to be region by region, but we do expect real estate prices like coming out of the 2008 recession. I didn't start buying multifamily properties in the Midwest in size until like 20, 2013. The real estate market didn't bottom in much of the United States till 2013 after the 2008 catastrophe. So it's not like the stock market. The real estate market lags um, the stock market by two, three, four years. So we could be in a scenario where, you know, the equity market bottoms well before the real estate market does. Hey, Jay. And there's also an overbuilding in multifamily, which I think a lot of people are not focusing on, especially like high end multi. Jay. Yeah. I Sorry. Just real quick, I, I, you know, I, I live in uh, Minneapolis, and you know, sixty-five percent of the office spaces are still empty, and they are converting to some sort of housing and other things, right? So, I do think this whole working from home thing and you know, remote working completely going away. And you are absolutely right. I was really, I was really curious about lot of single family house has doubled in price in some area in some uh, some regions right and i still don't see it's going down i see like yeah, some people slashing 5000 10000 yeah uh, do you know why because you don't people locked in these all time low like my mortgage rate is 2. Point, you know 2. Point something percent and for a 30 year and i have no incentive to move or sell my property right because i know what my carrying cost is and even if I'm going to own this property forever, I'm running it out. So, you know, I'm getting the benefits of 22 and a half year depreciation. I'm getting, you know, I have a property management agreement. I'm not really worried about the near term. I'm looking at a 20 year horizon and, you know, prices will change unless someone dies or God forbid, or has to move their job or has kids and needs a bigger space right? You, unless there's a forced reason to move, right? You're not going to see trends that you're going to see the number of transactions continue to fall lower and lower and lower and lower and lower. And that's what we've seen. So you're not going to see price changes overnight, unless you have a scenario like in Canada, where like 20% of people are worried about paying their mortgage because they're on a floating rate mortgage. So in places like, you know, in the Netherlands or in the UK or in Canada, you're going to see property prices fall a lot faster because there's a real catalyst, which is the mortgage repricing. In the US, where predominantly, I think less than 4% of people in the United States have floating rate mortgages, which is down from like the teens in 2008, you have a scenario where if you're locked in with a 15 to 30 year mortgage, you're incentivized to do nothing. Yeah, so that, that bid ask spread is gonna take a long time to, that's why the real estate market takes so long to bottom. Okay. How about the new new builder, right? Anybody buying new houses, they have to uh, get it with a very high interest rate, right? So they are they are selling. So, that's, so yeah. that I will, I actually learned that there are the home builders, right? Polte, Beezer, Hovnanian. You guys know the high end is Hovnanian. Beezer's, you know, Lennar tend to be lower end. What the home builders have been doing is that they have been buying down mortgage rates for people and they've been lowering the cost of financing when they mm -hmm. sell new homes they have been offering concessions and you know so they've been kind of helping 
homeowners around that, but those, they're not going to be able to do that forever. So mm -hmm. I, I think that the new, you know, obviously you look at the H XHB, we were short earlier in the year, right? Home builders will be adversely affected, but in the short term, they've been working to sell the inventory they have on hand by offering these incentives to people. Hey, Jay, Thank you. Is, it, is it fair to say your overall macro view of this, like from a time period perspective, because um, people argue it's like the 70s, it's like dot com bubble, but the way you're breaking it down, it, it does sound like it's more akin to the post World War II sort of like super hyperinflation with super quick deflation. No, 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 not. No, 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 no. I think it's completely different. I think we're entering a period of time where goods inflation is coming down, yep. real estate inflation is coming down. And there's going to be some stickiness with wages. So we might be in a scenario where like the Fed has to say, well, we have to be OK with like three to four percent inflation. Mm -hmm. um, but I do think that if we enter a recession, we might actually go sub three yeah. percent in early 2024 before we come back. So I actually don't think it's like that period at all. I also think that like at that period of time, people were having kids, you know, like, like crazy. the household formation is so low, right? Like, I don't think you can compare. I don't think you can compare now to the 70s because that was a manufacturing economy and we're in a service economy. I don't think you can compare now to the early 2000s because we have <laughs> 20 times as much debt now as we had then. Mm -hmm. And I don't think we can compare. I Like, I don't think any time period in the past can really compare to the situation we're in today. I know you got to go soon, but just on the services thing with wages, and I think this is just one of the things that concerns me with the Fed. Like, I feel like since 2010, we've been hyper-focused on, on services wages. And in reality is, it's mostly the marginal hourly employer. It's not really the salary, middle class, upper middle class employment that we've kind of, the Fed's had to, to monitor. It's really been at the margin. And I know we've been talking about sort of like 20% raises. I think the the real wage effect has been sort of less than inflationary. Um, so I know we still, it, on paper, it looks like it's sticky, but like, I'm just thinking about this from like a macroeconomic perspective. If we're having mass white collar salaried employee workers get laid off, which is happening across multiple sectors, the demand for hotel wait, you know, waiters, bus boys, you know, hotel receptionists, et cetera, all these other services that people were using, like, can we really rely on the stickiness of the, the tightness in the lower end jobs when we're really going to have like, you know, if we are having this recessionary period, we're going to have a less demand in the services because the layoffs are going, people are not spending what they were before when they had high paying jobs at Google or tech or, you know, Goldman Sachs or whatever it is, right? Like, there's been this is kind of the first time in in a long time we're seeing broad based layoffs across multiple sectors um, that are in the higher income bracket. Could you kindly summarize the question because it's a long question. Sorry, so, my girlfriend just elbowed me in the in the. So ribs. the question is like, if the Fed's so focused on service jobs, like, are they missing? Are they kind of not seeing the trees through the forest that these service jobs are going to not be super tight because there's not going to be demand for them if all these white collar jobs are off? And we're kind of not. I, so I, I see where you're going. We, If you track the, the number of layoffs, we had several hundred thousand layoffs across tech, financial services. You look at the headline layoffs at the banks, at the big tech firms. You know, small business is the bread and butter of America, 70 percent of the economy. And when you look at small business, the reason why layoffs are taking longer is that it was so hard for these people to find find these hires in the first place. They're going to be more reticent to let them go. There is a real labor shortage. So these big companies, they can afford to hit their EPS targets by laying 5%, 10% people off. It's not going to affect their business at all. You saw Elon lay off 70%, 70% 70 of his staff and Twitter still working, right? A lot of the bloated, you know, larger organizations can afford to do that. I would really like to see a poll or a survey of, you know, small and mid-sized businesses and how quickly they've been laying off. And I would, I think that they tend to be less, some of them tend to be less forward-looking and those layoffs might lag. Some of the bigger headline layoffs you're, you're reading at, you know, the big tech companies. Yeah, I think that tracks. Awesome. I, uh, Rosanna, I think that we should let Jay go. We yeah. should let him go. Sure. Uh, thank, thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much, Jay, for everything. You um, enlightened us all with all so much. 
We really appreciate you so much. You're a great addition to, to the FinTech community and you enlighten us all. So I appreciate you. Thanks so much, guys. Um, I'd like to say I'm not always right. So I'm happy to, you know, you can point it out. I, I, I learn from everyone on here, just like you learn from me. And also, and we do have a website, you know, specialsystresearch.com. We started it during COVID. Yes. Please we tell have, us about that. Sure thing. We have nine analysts now. We cover a variety of asset classes. Um, we cover, you know, a database of 375 closed end funds across muni bonds, across um, high yield, investment grade, um, we are going to be focusing even on some of the equity closed in funds where you can buy them at a discount to NAV. We tend to look at opportunities where there's an activist investor involved, where there's a high dividend or a, or a tax affected dividend that's higher than what you can make in an ETF or buying bonds outright. We also have a preferred product where we have a list of 700 names that we've shared and we've highlighted in terms of the series line items, 81 names that we're either doing work on or we think are a good risk reward. We also look at value opportunities and merger ARB opportunities. There are several that we are fortunate um, that worked out last year. And this year, one that recently has done well is AJRD, which is defense contractor, uh, which had L3 and GE looking at it. There are a couple others that we have in the pipe. We also look at spinoffs and split offs um, and value names with the catalyst. So we have been positioned, our position, our portfolios, the positioning has changed pretty dramatically from 2020 to 2021 to 2022. And with our, our educational discord, we also have hedge fund managers, formal hedge fund managers, PMs of ETFs um, and mutual funds that are actually subscribers and they, they talk and share ideas. So it's a really active community, the average age is well over 40 years old so you're you know you're talking to people who have a lot of experience so we have a community aspect and we have you know weekly emails that go out you know sometimes we'll have a model sometimes it'll be a macro overview sometimes it'll be an in industry overview sometimes sometimes it'll be you know a quick nudge you know we shared that tepper interview earlier in the morning before before the, the market meltdown um we'll have a lot of respect for appalooza and tepper um, he did also come from Goldman, but he's one of the smartest guys I know. So there's a lot, a lot of information, and I know it's difficult to sometimes to understand on the website. But if, if you, a quick introduction is if you pick pick the educational Discord plan, it gives you free access to the macro emails, free access to our long short ideas, and you'll get access to the community when people are talking at all times of the day, 3 a.m you know, 2 p.m. on various trades across futures, um, equities, mutual funds, closed end funds, fixed income. There tends to be a broader variety of topics and asset classes covered and less focused on kind of momentum and day trading and more on risk mitigation. And what we do is we share a handful of ideas that we think are interesting, and then you pick the size in the trade. It's not about following or timestamping. It's providing contests context and our views around risk management and, and ideas and companies and sectors and give you enough for you to do your own work and you know the idea is education is more powerful the time value of of knowledge is more powerful than the time value of money so the best thing you can do is to learn for yourself and build your own um, process and not have to rely on someone to spoon feed you so that's the idea around special situations thank you Rosanna and the team for, and Ryan for, for setting this up and, you know, would love to do this again sometime. And, and Joe, I see you're up here as well. You know, we've, we've uh, done a space in the past as well. Yeah, absolutely. And specialsitsresearch.com. I'm on the page right now. It's a great website. There's so many different memberships. Uh, check it out. Specialsitsresearch.com. It's frankly very, you know, inexpensive for what you actually get. You know, for the $45, you're, you're listening to hundreds of, you know, professional traders share their own thoughts and ideas. You're getting macro insights. You're getting long form models and comps and memos on different merger situations. And it's all kind of included there. So it's a pretty, um, pretty low price. And all the proceeds right now are literally just going to pay the employees. And that helps me with my own ideas. So it's a, it's, you know, it's a, it's a full circle there. Um, and it's a lot of fun for me. Thank you so much for everything. Appreciate you very much. Thank you for listening to the Rose Show podcast. Please visit rosannaprestia.com for more episodes. See you soon.